It's time for another tour of ancient artifact discoveries. And it's a tour that will take us all over the world. We'll be seeing and hearing the stories of remarkable objects found in incredible circumstances, some of which must be seen to be believed. Let's start that process of seeing and believing right now. The Malia Altar Stone is a fascinating archaeological artifact for many reasons. It's the only known example of Cretan hieroglyphs being carved onto stone, for example. However, its true value lies in the fact that the symbols etched onto its surface are almost identical to the symbols carved on the legendary Phaistos disc. The artifact was found close to Malia in Crete by a farmer during the 1990s. It was probably created by the ancient Minoans, and is similar in design to the altar stones known to have been made by their civilization but is the only one bearing hieroglyphic markings to have been discovered thus far. By cross-referencing the glyphs that appear here with those on the Phaistos disc, it's possible to interpret the text as, if you care for force and quantity, correct your path to the goddess Mean. That's clearly an imperfect translation of the original text, but it gets us a step closer to working out what the Phaistos disc might have been made for even if we understand almost nothing about the goddess Mean and what she stood for. While we're talking about the Minoans, let's take a moment to talk about their burial practices. Every ancient civilization in the world came up with its own unique burial style, but almost all of those burials involve a coffin or a sarcophagus. The Minoan version of the sarcophagus is known as a larnax, but a larnax is considerably smaller than what you'd expect a coffin to look like. That's because of what's inside it. When we tell you that the larnax is sometimes also referred to as an ash chest, that ought to give you a hint about what you can expect to find inside it. However, the people who were buried inside ash chests weren't always cremated. Sometimes the bodies were bent or folded repeatedly until they fit inside the box. The first known Larnaxes were created during the Minoan era of the Aegean civilization. Back then, they were made of ceramic materials, and are likely to have been styled after the type of linen chests that were popular in Egypt. Later on, during the Hellenistic era, they were made of terracotta and painted like vases. In some cases, like the 2,400-year-old Larnax that was found in Virginia, Macedonia, Larnaxes were even made of gold. During the 18th and 19th centuries, the part of Japan that's known as Tokyo today was called Edo. The most popular form of entertainment in Edo was a type of sideshow carnival called a misemono. What was on offer inside a misemono was often billed as educational, but in practice they often amounted to freak shows designed to shock their audiences. One of the most popular exhibits in the old Edo misemonos was the pregnant doll. Several examples of these anatomically correct dolls have been found over the years, and it was once thought that they were used to teach midwives the correct method for delivering a baby. But historians now think that they might have been used for entertainment purposes instead. The quality of the pieces varies from doll to doll, but some are so detailed that they come with multiple fetuses designed to demonstrate every stage of the human gestation process. Quite what the people of Edo found so entertaining about the dolls is unknown, but their popularity led to the creation of some beautiful models. It wouldn't be inaccurate to describe them as works of art. We're going to November 2020 for our next discovery, which happened at the site of an ancient necropolis in Autun, France. It's this beautiful Roman-era diatretic glass vase made from reticulated glass. The Romans were exceptionally gifted at making glass artifacts, with skills that were light years ahead of every other civilization of their era. When it was found, the vase was smashed into hundreds of pieces, but experts spent a full year putting the pieces back together and were delighted to find that they had the whole vase. The cemetery was in use between the 3rd and 5th centuries, and the vase was found at the feet of an unknown individual who probably died during the 4th century. Only 10 Roman reticulated glass artifacts have ever been found, 
Of those 10, this is the only one to turn up in France or Gaul as the Romans knew it. The quality of the restoration and repair work is so good that we can now read the vase's original inscription. It says, Vivas Feliciter. It translates as live in happiness. If you thought the cliched motto, live, laugh, love, was a plague of the modern age, think again. While the 19th century residents of Edo were getting a detailed look at pregnancy, the 19th century residents of the United States of America were getting a rather less forensic view of womanhood thanks to the works of D.W. Kellogg. Somewhere close to the year 1833, Kellogg released a map called A Map of the Open Country of a Woman's Heart. A helpful subheading on the map's cover informs us that the purpose of the map is to exhibit the internal communications of the female heart, as well as the facilities available to all who travel through the heart and the dangers that the organ can pose to those travelers. Unsurprisingly, given the prevailing attitudes of the time, Kellogg's work depicts women as being selfish, superficial, overly sentimental, and driven by vanity. Love is placed at the center of the female heart, with qualities like patience, common sense, and prudence positioned some distance away at the bottom of the organ. At the bottom of the map's cover, it's claimed that the map was drawn by a lady, but historians have proven beyond all reasonable doubt that it's Kellogg's work. It's the very definition of a 19th century curiosity. We've already covered the idea that there have been some unusual burial traditions around the world over the years. Here's another oddity that you may have seen during funerals if you lived in the United Kingdom during the Victorian era of the 19th century. It's known as a lacrimatory bottle, or to give it its colloquial name, a tear catcher. Some myths and rumors say that similar devices were used by the ancients of Greece, Rome, and Italy. But Victorian Britain is the only place and time direct evidence of their use has been recorded. It was once believed that people collected their tears in these bottles during funerals, and when the tears had evaporated, the period of mourning could officially come to an end. Similar vessels have been collected from ancient tombs all over the world and have been mistaken for tear catchers, but they were more likely used to hold perfume. Some anecdotal evidence suggests that the practice may have extended to America, where the widows of Civil War casualties would use the tear catchers during the funerals of their husbands, but solid evidence of this is hard to come by. Next up, we have a Kigango. What is a Kigango, you might ask? Well, it's a wooden memorial statue of the kind carved by the Mijikenda people who live in the southeastern coast of Kenya. They don't look especially humanoid in shape, but they're supposed to be effigies of the human form. Nobody knows when the practice of erecting Kigango effigies began, but in the old days, they were built to last. Once they were erected, they tended to be left there until they rotted away, a process that could take centuries. Each Kigango was roughly life-sized and would be painted in colors that were relevant to the deceased. Andy Warhol was known to be a great admirer of Kigango and kept several of them in his galleries. There are several more in the museums and art galleries of the United States of America, although public opinion is beginning to put pressure on the owners of those museums to return the artifacts to Kenya. In their native country, Kigango effigies are associated with a secret society known as the Gohu, about which very little is known. Speaking of artifacts that are currently inside American museums, here's a bird-shaped brooch that's currently on display inside the Met Museum in New York. It's Frankish in origin and would have been used to hold clothing in place. The artifact comes from either the 6th or the 7th century. Back then, the clothing of the average Frankish woman usually comprised a tunic held in place by a belt, over the top of which a cloak or wrap would be worn pinned in place with a brooch like this one. Decorative brooches like this beautiful bird were once all the rage, but by the end of the 7th century, tastes had changed, and most women wore simple, large, disc-shaped brooches instead. The brooch in the Met is considered to be one of the best-preserved and most accomplished examples of its kind. 
highlighting the skill and virtuosity of the Frankish metalworkers of the era. The brooch was gifted to the museum by J. Pierpont Morgan in 1917, but unfortunately, its history and provenance prior to that aren't known. Please excuse the pun, but we've now broached the topic of brooches. With that in mind, it would be rude to move on without talking about the Rogart brooch. This amazingly well-preserved brooch is thought to be Pictish in origin and was probably made during the 8th century. It might not have looked out of place on the clothing of a Frankish woman 200 years earlier, as its design includes glass bird head decorations. The Rogart brooch is so named because it was found in the village of Rogart, Scotland in 1868 during rock blasting ahead of the construction of the Sutherland Railway. It's made from a band of silver decorated with interlaced patterns of gold, topped with a thick head. Several other brooches were discovered at the same time as the Rogart brooch, but the one that's now on display at the National Museum of Scotland is easily the most impressive in the collection. The fact that they were all discovered together suggests that they were buried deliberately. Historians aren't sure whether they were buried as votive offerings or whether the burial was merely the act of a woman trying to make sure that her jewelry collection didn't get stolen. How much can you tell about a person from their excrement? Well, it turns out you can find out quite a lot, even if the person in question has been dead for two centuries. A March 2021 study of ancient fecal samples taken from a privy on the campus of Dartmouth College in New England, USA, has proven that the ruling elites who lived in the area during the 19th century suffered badly from parasitic intestinal infections. This can probably be attributed to poor sanitation and, frankly, disgusting conditions in the privy itself. You might think this finding was to be expected, but it was previously thought that parasitic infections only existed in urban areas at the time. This privy would have belonged to an affluent rural household. Choate House, which once stood on this land, was home to the Alcotts, who would have been among the best educated people in the New England of the time. All that money and knowledge apparently didn't protect them from the same ailments that afflicted the poor. The Alcotts lived comfortably, but these tapeworm and whipworm infestations meant that they wouldn't necessarily have felt all that comfortable all the time. The Adena Pipe is so named because it was discovered in the Adena Mound of Ross County, Ohio, USA in 1901. In turn, the mound is named after the Adena people. Tubular pipes are common Adena discoveries because tobacco use was widespread among the people, but effigy pipes are far less common. It's this factor that makes the Adena pipe so interesting, and it also explains why it's been selected to be the state artifact of Ohio. Aside from being an interesting object, it's also provided archaeologists with plenty of information about Adena culture. The pipe is so detailed that it contains representations of hair, clothing, and ornamental accessories. Were it not for the existence of the pipe, these details of what the Adena people looked like wouldn't be known to modern archaeologists. Experts believe that it's around 2,300 years old. It was found in the grave of an adult male and might even be a representation of what he looked like when he was alive. Archaeologists think it's possible that he was either a shaman or a medicine man. Large-scale construction projects have a habit of turning up forgotten treasures from the past when workers dig into ground that hasn't been disturbed in years. We saw that happen in January 2017, when workers building a new crossrail station on Tottenham Court Road in London, England, made the strange discovery of a collection of thousands of pickle pots and jam jars dating back to the country's Victorian era. There are more than 13,000 pots and jars in the collection, all of which are more than 120 years old. The vessels are all stamped with the logo of a company called Cross & Blackwell, which once owned a factory on the site but shut it down in 1921. The company is still trading today, so perhaps they should have been asked to come and clear up their mess. 
The whole collection was found stuffed into an enormous cistern, which once powered the steam engines that, in turn, powered the factory. Many of the pots are sealed and still contain their original contents, which include things like marmalade, jam, piccalilli, and mushroom ketchup. While the idea of mushroom ketchup might sound disgusting to most people today, it was popular in Victorian London. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.